The Third Sex. Excerpted from the Bow in the Club. Julius Avola. 1968. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. 1. There is no doubt that the increase in homosexuality as well as the inroads made by what has been called the third sex constitutes a phenomenon typical of the last period, and not only in Italy. As regards homosexuality, one peculiar trait is worth noting, it is no longer limited, as was largely the case in the past, to the upper classes, artists, aesthetes, decadent pursuers of perversions and deviant experiences, but has come to affect also the so-called simple folk and the lower classes. Only the middle class has been spared, at least to some extent. It is not worth investigating here the problem of homosexuality itself. In one of my works, I have conducted a systematic study of every possible form of eroticism, not confining myself to normal forms but also drawing attention to all those which distinguished other ages and civilizations. However, this book hardly makes any mention of homosexuality at all. The reason for this is that starting from the very concept of sexuality, even in its broader sense, and leaving aside all social prejudices, it is not easy to elucidate the phenomenon of homosexuality. It essentially falls within the category of pathology understood in a broad and objective sense, and not merely for its opposition to what current ideas of bourgeois morality take to be healthy. I will briefly frame the question by distinguishing two of its aspects. The second of these will lead us to the sociological level and, in a way, to the kind of considerations made in the previous chapter. In the work just mentioned, I set out from the idea that all normal sexuality derives from the psychophysical states engendered by the opposition of two principles operating like magnetic poles, the masculine and the feminine. I am speaking here of masculine and feminine in an absolute sense, meaning two principles governing what is ultimately a metaphysical, and not just a physical, order. These principles may be present to widely varying degrees in men and women. Indeed, in real life absolute men and women are found just about as often as the abstract triangle of pure geometry. We rather find beings in whom either the masculine quality is predominant, men, or the feminine one is, women, but in whom the opposite quality is never completely absent. The basic law of sexual attraction, already presented by Plato and Schopenhauer, and later clearly formulated by Weininger, is that sexual attraction in its most typical form stems from the encounter between a man and woman such that the sum of the masculine and feminine parts contained in each makes up an absolute man and an absolute woman. To illustrate this with an example, a man who is three-quarters man and one-quarter woman will find himself irresistibly, magnetically attracted to a woman who is three-quarters woman and one-quarter man, for the sum in this case would be precisely one absolute man and one absolute woman, combined into one. This law applies to every intense, deep and elementary eroticism between the two sexes, it does not concern degraded, watered-down, bourgeois or merely ideal and sentimental forms of love and sexuality. Now, the law in question also allows us to identify those cases in which homosexuality is understandable and natural, these are the cases in which the sex of two individuals is not very differentiated. Let us take, for example, a man who is only 55% man and for the remainder woman. His natural counterpart will be a being who is 55% woman and for the remainder man, but a being of this sort will hardly differ from a man, and since one must consider not just the external, physical sex but also, or even especially, the interior one, this being may well be physiologically male, and the same applies to a woman in a similar case. Such poorly differentiated sexuations may be associated with the concept of a third sex, although these are clearly only extreme cases. This would explain the origin and foundation of the relations between homosexual men or between lesbians as natural phenomena, deriving from a peculiar, congenital conformation and from the very same law that, when applied to a different conformation, leads to normal sexual relations. In these cases alone, there is little point in stigmatizing homosexuality as a corruption, since for beings such as those mentioned here so-called natural relations would not be natural at all, but contrary to their nature. Likewise, it would be pointless to trust the efficacy of prophylactic measures or therapies, if one, quite reasonably, does not believe that such measures are capable of altering what in biology is referred to as the constitutional type, the individual's congenital psychophysical constitution. If one were to formulate a moral judgment with regard to the corresponding state of affairs in these extreme cases, one ought to censure chiefly male homosexuality, since it entails the degradation of one of the two men as a person and his sexual use as a woman. This is not the case with lesbians, if it is true that, as the ancients used to say, totum mulier sexus, if, that is, sexuality is the essential undercurrent of feminine nature, then a relation between two women is not quite as degrading, provided it is a relationship between two equally feminine women and not the grotesque caricature of a normal heterosexual relationship, 
with one woman playing the part of the man. If this general picture does not explain all cases of homosexuality, this is due to the fact that a fair share of them fall within a different category, that of abnormal forms in the precise sense, they are determined by extrinsic factors, which require a different evaluation. If we were to take a broader look at the phenomenon, as it presents itself from a historical perspective and among other peoples, in many cases we would have to take into account a different range of factors. I mean to say that such phenomena can no longer be explained by invoking the sexual attraction engendered by any sort of polarity between the masculine principle and the feminine one, considered in themselves that is, independently of the different degrees to which they may be present in individual men and women. For instance, male homosexuality in the classical world constitutes an altogether different phenomenon. As is widely known, Plato sought to define it as an aesthetic factor. In this case, it is clear that, strictly speaking, we are not dealing with erotic attraction at all. For in such cases the kind of rapture and elation usually triggered by a creature of the opposite gender, according to the law of polarity of the sexes, is instead activated by other objects, which serve as a mere support or trigger for the phenomenon in question. Thus Plato speaks of eros as a form of divine madness, or mania, which is akin to other forms of madness unrelated to sex, and which becomes increasingly detached from the corporeal, or indeed carnal, level. Plato establishes a progression in which the rapture and love stirred by an ephebe only represent the lowest degree, since in the other degrees these feelings are elicited by spiritual beauty, in the ascent to the idea of pure, abstract and heavenly beauty. Just to what extent this homosexual platonic love, which at its lowest degree would be purer, since it does not have a woman as its object and hence cannot serve any reproductive purposes, may be invoked to justify the practice of ancient pederasty is an altogether different question. Certainly, it can hardly be invoked at all in relation to the decadent period of Roman history. Plato's theory finds an echo in certain Muslim milieus. However, it would be difficult to associate it with the kind of homosexuality that is so widespread among the Turks. In the Ottoman army for instance, at any rate in the past, as the case reported by Colonel Lawrence suggests, it seems as though any attempt on a soldier's part not to yield to his officer's desire was practically regarded as an act of insubordination. Furthermore, in this case it seems as though another factor has sometimes been at work, a factor which has nothing to do with sexuality in itself, according to a certain person's confession which was recently reported to me, once again, from the Turkish area, what is effective here is the thrill caused in the active homosexual by a feeling of power. But this background is far from clear in itself, given all the number of ways in which the libido dominandi, or desire to dominate, can be exercised and satisfied even in normal relationships with women. Homosexuality in Japan presents a similar problem. Generally speaking, none of these phenomena can be explained as extreme examples of the above-mentioned law of sexual complementarity, for the condition of a weakly differentiated sex in both partners does not occur in them. In homosexual couples, we might find one partner who is markedly virile for example, i.e. who might show the masculine quality to a high degree, rather than a relationship between two representatives of the intermediate hybrid form of the third sex. The phenomenon of the deflection of erotic love, which makes its emergence possible outside the normal conditions of sexual attraction, the polarity and hence magnetism between the two sexes, and therefore in a way also the phenomenon of its displacement, or transfer, onto a different object, a phenomenon clearly established by psychoanalysis, can therefore provide an additive explanation of homosexuality. But a few considerations of a different sort are also necessary here. 2. We previously considered the constitution of individuals with regard to sex, their sexuation, the degree to which they are men or women, as something preformed and fixed. Now we must broaden the picture to include those cases in which certain changes become possible as a consequence of regressive processes, possibly favored by certain general conditions in the environment, society, and civilization. To begin with, we must form a more precise idea about sex, which may be defined as follows. The fact that we find 100% male or 100% female individuals only in exceptional cases, and that in each individual we find residues of the other sex, is related to the fact, well known in biology, that the embryo is initially not sexually differentiated at all, but presents traits belonging to both sexes. Sexuation is produced only in a subsequent process, which seems to begin in the fifth or sixth month of gestation, then the traits of one gender prevail and increasingly develop, while those of the opposite gender atrophy or remain latent, as is widely known, in the purely somatic sphere residues of the other sex are to be found, as for instance in the half-developed breasts of males and in the female clitoris. Thus, once the development is complete, the sex of the male or female individual must be regarded as the effect of a predominant force which leaves its mark on this process, 
neutralizing and excluding the originally coexistent possibilities of the other sex, particularly in the bodily, physiological sphere, in the psychological sphere, the margin of fluctuation can be far broader. Now, the dominant power responsible for sexuation may weaken due to a process of regression. Then, just as happens in the political sphere at the weakening of a central authority in a society, all the lower forces which had hitherto been held in check may free themselves and resurface, in the individual, latent traits of the other sex may emerge and, with them, a bisexual inclination. Thus we will once again find the condition of the third sex, obviously a particularly fertile soil for the phenomenon of homosexuality. Its precondition, then, is an inner yielding, a collapse of one's inner form or, rather, of that forming power which manifests itself not only in sexuation but also in one's character and personality, in one's having, in general, a particular persona. We can understand, then, why the development of homosexuality even among popular strata, potentially in endemic forms, is a sign of the times, one that logically falls among those phenomena which make the modern world regressive. This leads us back to the considerations made in the previous chapter. In an egalitarian and democratized society, in the broader sense of the term, in a society in which there are no longer any castes, functional organic classes or orders, in a society in which culture is standardized, extrinsic, utilitarian, and tradition is no longer a living, forming force, in a society in which pinders be thyself has become but a meaningless phrase, in a society in which character amounts to a luxury that only fools can afford, whereas inner weakness is the norm, in a society, finally, in which whatever lies above racial, ethnic and national difference has been replaced by what effectively lies below all this and which, therefore, has a shapeless and hybrid character, in such a society, forces are at work that in the long run are bound to influence the very constitution of individuals, thus affecting everything typical and differentiated, even in the psychophysical field. Democracy is not a mere political and social fact, it is a general climate which, in the long term, is destined to have regressive consequences on the existential level itself. In the particular domain of the sexes, this can promote the kind of inner decay, the kind of weakening of the inner power of sexuation that, as already noted, represents the premise for the emergence and spread of the third sex and, with it, of many truly striking forms of homosexuality in contemporary society. On the other hand, another consequence of all this is the visible trivialization and primitivization of normal sexual relations between young members of the latest generations, on account of reduced tension due to the lower degree of polarity. Even certain strange phenomena which were apparently very rare in the past, such as sex changes, men taking on female bodies and vice versa, may be understood in the same terms and traced back to the same causes, it is as though in today's general climate the potentialities of the opposite gender contained within each of us had acquired an exceptional possibility of resurfacing and activating itself on account of the weakening of that central force which, even biologically, defines one's type, to the point of replacing and changing the sex one was born with. If the argument made so far is a convincing one, in this case too we are only to take this as a sign of the times and to acknowledge the utter inanity of all moralizing and socially repressive conformist measures. It is impossible to hold together the sand running through our fingers, no matter how hard we try. Rather, we ought to reach the level of first causes, of which everything else in all the various domains, including that of the phenomena just considered, is only a consequence, and act at that level so as to produce an essential change. But this is tantamount to saying that the principle of everything ought to be the overcoming of the present civilization and society, and the restoration of a differentiated, organic and well-structured type of social organization through the intervention of a forming, living, central force. Now, this prospect increasingly seems like sheer utopia, since progress in all fields today tends increasingly in the opposite direction. Those who inwardly do not belong, and do not wish to belong, to this world have no choice but to note those general relations of cause and effect that escape our contemporaries in their blindness, and to calmly take stock of all that is sprouting forth, according to a clear logic, from the soil of a decaying world.